For the next few episodes, I wanted to analyse something that everyone can watch for free on YouTube and Steam. Oat Studios, an independent film studio, was started by Oscar-nominated South African filmmaker Neil Bloomkamp in 2017. Some films that he has done are Elysium, Chappie, and of course, District 9. So, with that said, the sort of content that he creates is expected to be thriller-slash-horror, sci-fi, and unnervingly otherworldly. The main goal for this enterprise was to distribute experimental short films via YouTube and Steam, and then see what the community engages with most. This interest and feedback would eventually show which short films could be made into potential feature-length ones. So in terms of a studio putting the audience first, it's not a bad idea. And with a director like Neil on the helm, it would be a visually spectacular one. So let's dive in, placing the short films as episodes themselves, making this part one of three in a series from Oat Studios. This is two takes, and this is one shot. Analysis of the Oat Studios Volume 1, Zygote, Part 1. Be warned, spoilers are ahead. From the many hints and small trailers and perhaps from the title page, the one with the girl looking scared with many hands over her mouth, it can perhaps give you an indication that this short is concentrating on hands and her as the main protagonist. And you would be right. The inclusion of the hand symbols for each letter of the main title could indicate that communication is key here, but basing assumptions on little things can only lead us more unanswered questions. So let's cut to the chase. I'm going to give you the backstory, and then we can figure out the theory and analyse it from there. 20 years ago, a smattering of large, mineral-rich asteroids crashed into northern Canada and Russia. At a remote mining outpost operated by Cerberus Minerals in the Northwest Territories, an anomalous, crystalline alien object described as the Quartz has been recovered from one of the asteroids. The Quartz, apparently sentient, cognitively affects humans by transmitting gigabytes of information via bursts of light, influencing them to assimilate organisms to construct a suitable body to inhabit. One personnel member afflicted by the light, known as Holbrook, used the organs of livestock to create such organisms before proceeding to construct a larger creature from the bodies of, of deceased personnel. The creature proceeded to kill him, and eventually all but two of the 98 personnel absorbing the bodies and memories of the remaining non-synthetic humans. So you can only imagine the type of monster that has been created, what with the splicing of many, many human body parts. Imagine the alien entity, with the interest lying in what it is going to do, rather than where it's come from. On the basis of many alien horror movies, this is following the same recipe. This type of alien, with its original form not being shown, for its powers to being mind control by simply looking at it, it can almost come across as Medusa-like. With its light, the data, transforming the humans that look upon it into viable vessels of manipulation instead of stone. Still immobile against its powers, stuck under its spell. But whilst the backstory has been explained, the alien's mechanisms of using all of the fingers of the many different personnel in the main story to open doors gain access and to essentially stalk the last two alive until they have succumbed to its powers. There is nowhere to hide. Even synthetic humans, used as a labour force, could not escape it. But let's look further. The short film is called Zygote, but what is that exactly? The zygote is the earliest developmental stage of a sex cell between two gamete cells, or a male sperm and a female egg cell. A zygote cell is both unicellular a single cell organism, and multicellular, more than one cell in an organism. This means the cell can include many cell types that can form different kinds of tissue, for example, plants, fungi, and some animals, like the chimpanzee. From a cell that can form itself into anything that is around it, the alien has formed with human DNA to the point of merging everything together, whether hosts are living or dead. And like the next developmental stage, where the cells multiply, this seems to happen with the body parts to make its body, and the information from the brains of the people it succumbs. It doesn't look like it will stop. So we understand the reasoning behind the alien, but surely, if it weren't mind, it would have been left alone to perhaps eventually succumb a natural death? Let's look at the evidence that is given to us. 
Placing it in a literal and scientific light, the naming of the crystalline alien object as quartz has been seen as no accident. Quartz is a hard crystalline mineral composed of silicon and oxygen atoms. It is the second most abundant mineral in Earth's continental crust. As well as the ability to reflect light, quartz can also be chiral, piezoelectric, and triboluminescent. The word chiral has been explored in the earlier episode of Death Stranding, and again, it has the same meaning. Chiral means the property of asymmetry, and the word chirality being derived from the Greek word meaning hand. An object or system is chiral if it is distinguishable from its mirror image, that is, it cannot be as superimposed. And from its Greek meaning, human hands are quite literally the best example for this. And isn't it interesting how the monster emphasises the use of hands in the film? But wait, there are more coincidences. Piezoelectricity is the electrical charge that accumulates in certain solid materials such as crystals and biological matter like bone, DNA and various proteins. It is the internal generation of electrical charge resulting from an applied mechanical force. This is one reaction. Another is from triboluminescent. This is a phenomenon that still cannot be explained. It is when light is generated when a material is mechanically pulled apart, ripped, scratched, crushed, or rubbed. It appears to be caused by the separation and reunification of static electrical charges. Upon the fracture of asymmetrical materials, the charge is separated. When the charges recombine, the electrical discharge ionizes the surrounding air, causing a flash of light. Now, think back to the story. The alien has been mined, with the reaction of being ripped apart to create electricity and light. And perhaps the alien has reacted back by using the light source as a way to store and exploit information like electricity for its own gain. And what is more, if looking at the creation of the universe, it began as a hot tiny mess of particles mixed with light and energy, and then it expanded, cooled down, and took form. Much like the alien had done when the humans interacted with it. In a way, it is almost presenting the ideology of creation and destruction in one heartbeat, and how human interaction can also be an interference that can help and hinder in both concepts. There are 98 personnel on the outpost, and in the story, we are immediately told that only two remain. So, understanding the implications of how the alien came about, let's look at the humans and the synthetic humans that have this job in the first place. The two remaining are Barkley, the blonde girl, and Quinn, the wounded man. Why is he wounded? Because he gorged his own eyes out in the hope that he didn't see the light. Barkley very quickly introduces herself as inferior and is presented as a synthetic human. She is canary class, making her one of the many that goes down to the mines to explore whether or not the gas is poisonous. This will report back to the humans to which they will react and fix. She was created, essentially, to die. And like in 1913, John Scott Haldane proposed putting a warm-blooded animal, such as canary, down a mine to detect carbon monoxide. The birds, being more sensitive, would become sick before the miners, giving them a chance to escape or put on protective respirators. This is the same with Barclay. There is a twist, as Quinn says. There's something wrong inside of me, I'm telling you, I can feel it. There's something wrong. It's getting worse. There's that thing. It projects synthetics. Maybe I can slow it down. Synthetics must be used as mining labor. Protocol 7, Statute 9, but you know how much true synthetics cost, the overhead involved. Synthetics, they cost more than orphans. We purchased you from the Strata Group. The company bought you when you were two weeks old. They're a fucking human, Barkley. That barcode would be put on you just to, just to fool the ocean inspectors. You can buy a couple of cinches to fool them. You can have your class, right? You, what's your job? Your job is to crawl down in the mine shafts, deep down into the asteroids. Your, your, your job is to die if you walk into a pocket of poison gas, right? Now, do you think a synthetic would get sick like that? Here, take the gun. Take it. So you're gonna get out, and you're gonna tell everyone about this place. About you, about who you are, about the quartz, how it flashes, you tell them.
So Barclay, through the second half of the film, is realising she is human. From being taught to understand that she was meant to die for the safety of others, she suddenly has to think of herself at the worst possible time. Of suggesting she could slow down this alien because she was synthetic, Barclay now has to put herself first when the alien that devours only humans. The worst time to learn the best thing about yourself. However, understanding this also represents a labour force to be child slash human labour, hidden by the inspectors for a cheaper result. A political point slipped in by Neil, for good measure, no doubt. This versus the exploitation of an alien convincing people to give it a body and information. Both as bad as each other, in the end. The mining company itself is called Cerberus. From Greek mythology, Cerberus, often referred to as the Hound of Hades, is a multi-headed dog that guards the gates of the underworld to prevent the dead from leaving. And although the mining company could be the last protective force, so-called, from the alien entity, it is not the dead that is attempting to leave. It is the reanimated dead, mixed with the living through the cellular manipulation that the alien can do that attempts to leave. And since there is no one else, the gates are now unguarded. Another allegory of Cerberus is the understanding that the three heads all represent the three origins of human strife, nature, cause, and accident as well as symbolising the three ages, infancy, youth and old age, until death enters the world. The human strife could categorise the events that happen within this world, the nature of the asteroid hitting these parts of the world, and then the cause of it being mined until the accident of it being sentient and wanting a body. In a way, the catastrophe could be seen as the humans deciding to bring the alien to the surface. And the three heads meaning the three stages of human age, if we go back to the exploitation of the company, of how Barclay was bought and placed in, into the company's care at two weeks old, this can be seen as a labour force going through all three stages and being under the company's control, and the ending would be their death at any stage of their life. It seems that the message from this short sci-fi film can be seen as a bleak one, the cycle of cause and effect between the humans who choose to mine something that can exploit them for its own gain, was at the same time, within the company, the task force is exploited by buying orphans and killing dozens of them, rather than buying synthetic humans to do the most dangerous jobs, shows both sides of the same coin. The aspect of creation, destruction by accident, and by intention, can be influenced by the people in power, and how being human at the worst possible time can perhaps save your life. But since this was an experimental project, it is essentially up to us to choose a story for a feature-length film. Would you say it's taken your interest? If you enjoyed what was said, please follow me on Anchor and Spotify. Be kept in the loop for new episodes by following my Instagram. And if you have any questions, email me at twotakespodcast1 at gmail.com. And as always, thanks for listening.